University of Santo Tomas Criminal Law Review, Prewick Notes 2016, Part 2. Uh, circumstances affecting criminal liability. Question. May the justifying circumstance of self-defense be invoked at the same time with the exempting circumstance or accident? No. The answer, no. Self-defense is inconsistent with the exempting circumstance of accident in which there is no intent to kill. On the other hand, self-defense necessarily contemplates a premeditated intent to kill in order to defend oneself for imminent danger. This case is found in Pomoy versus People, a G GR number 150647, September 29, 2004. In Toledo versus People, the Supreme Court held that there is no such defense as accidental self-defense in the realm of criminal law. Self-defense under Article 11, Paragraph 1 of the Revised Penal Code necessarily implies a deliberate and positive overt act of the accused to prevent or repeal an unlawful aggression of another with the use of reasonable means. The accused has freedom of action. He is aware of the consciousness of his deliberate acts. The defense is based on necessity, which is the supreme and irresistible master of men of all human affairs and of the law. From necessity and limited by it proceeds the right of self-defense. The right begins with necessity does and ends where it ends. This is found in Toledo versus People, 439 Skra 94, JR number 158057, September 24, 2004. Another question here. What is the concept of the battered woman syndrome? The battered woman syndrome refers to a scientifically defined pattern of psychological and behavioral symptoms found in women living in battering relationships as a result of cumulative abuse. It is a plea within the concept of the justifying circumstance of self-defense. People versus Hinosa, GR number 135981, January 15, 2004. Under Section 26 of RA 9262, it is provided that victim survivors who are found by the courts to be suffering from battered woman syndrome do not incur any criminal and civil liability, notwithstanding the absence of uh, any of the elements for justifying circumstances of self-defense under the Revised Penal Code. In the determination of the state of mind of the woman who, has, who was suffering from battered woman syndrome at the time of the commission of the crime, the courts shall be assisted by experts, psychiatrists, or psychologists. Uh, here's another question. Rogelio de los Reyes, along with Roderick Licayan and Roberto Lara, were charged with the crime of kidnapping for ransom. In his defense, De Los Reyes argued that he was merely passing by at the crime scene when one of the co-accused pointed a gun at him and forced him to guard the victims. Hence, he is entitled to the exempting circumstance of compulsion due to irresistible force. Is the exempting circumstance of compulsion due to the irresistible force present? The answer is... No. A person invoking the exempting circumstance of compulsion due to irresistible force admits, in effect, the commission of a punishable act which must show that the irresistible force reduced him to a mere instrument that acted not only without will but also against his will. 
the jurist, force, fear, or intimidation must be present, imminent and impending, and it must be of such nature as to induce a well-grounded apprehensions of death or serious bodily harm if the act is not done. It is hard to believe that a person who accidentally discovers kidnapped victims would be held at a gunpoint by the kidnappers to guard the said victims. This is People v. Likayan et al. GR number 203961, July 29, 2015. Here's another scenario. Why, while alighting from his vehicle, was hit by X with his car. This caused X to be thrown four meters away from his jeepney. X was charged with frustrated murder and convicted in the RTC of frustrated homicide. Upon appeal in the CA, the crime was modified to reckless imprudence resulting in serious physical injuries. X contends that the CA should have appreciated voluntary surrender as a mitigating circumstance in his favor. Is X's contention correct? The answer, no. The mitigating circumstance of voluntary surrender cannot be appreciated in his favor. Paragraph 5 of Article 365, Revised Penal Code, expressly states that in the imposition of the penalties, the court shall exercise their sound discretion without regard to the rules prescribed in Article 64 of the Revised Penal Code. This is Mariano v. People, GR number 178145, July 7, 2014. Here's another question. Is a person who was convicted of rape but granted an absolute pardon by the president and one year thereafter convicted of homicide a recidivist? The answer, yes. A recidivist is one who at the time of his trial for one crime shall have been previously convicted by final judgment of another crime embraced in the same title of this code rape is now a crime against persons and like the crime of homicide is embraced in the same title of the revised penal code the absolute pardon granted to a person for rape only excused him from serving the sentence for rape but did not erase the effects of the conviction unless expressly remitted by the pardon another question May this regard of age and sex be appreciated in robbery and homicide, which is a crime against property? The answer, no. With respect to this regard of age and sex, the same may be appreciated only in crimes against person or honor. It is not correct to consider his aggravating circumstance in crimes against property. Besides, robbery with homicide is principally a crime against property and not against persons. Homicide is a mere incident of the robbery and the latter being the main purpose and object of the criminal. This is People v. Hernandez, GR number 139697, June 15, 2004. Another question here, Balwig, stop an innocent bystander who accidentally bumped him. The innocent bystander died as a result of the stabbing. Balawig was arrested and was tested to be positive for the use of shabu at the time he committed the stabbing. What should be the proper charge against Balawig? The proper charge is murder. The killing constitutes murder. Because the commission of a crime under influence of prohibited drugs is a qualifying aggravating circumstance. Another question here. X, while descending from a curved path, collided with a motorcycle, thereby killing Y, one of its passengers, and causing serious physical injuries to the two other victims. The body of Y was loaded into the vehicle of X, 
but the latter's engine would not start. Thus, the body was loaded in a different vehicle. The jack of X was used to intricate the body of Y from being pinned under the vehicle of X. X, in his defense, claimed that it was not his fault that the tricycle swerved in his direction. X was charged with reckless imprudence resulting to homicide with double serious physical injuries and damage to property under Article 365 in relation to Article 263 of the RPC with the aggravating circumstance that accused failed to lend on the spot to the injured party such help that was in his hands to give. Should the court appreciate the alleged aggravating circumstance? The answer, no. The aggravating circumstance that accused failed to lend on the spot to the injured party such help that was in his hands to give should not be appreciated. Verily, it is the inexcusable lack of precaution or the conscious indifference to the consequence of the conduct which supplies the criminal intent in Article 365. The limiting element in the last paragraph of Article 365 of the RPC, which imposes the penalty next higher in degree upon the offender who fails to lend on the spot to the injured party such help as may be in his hands to give according to the case, A is dependent on the means in the hands of the offender. Example, the type and degree of assistance that he or she at the time and place of the incident is capable of giving. And letter B, requires adequate proof. But X, in the case of X, uh, X was able to supply the help according to the extent of his capabilities. This case is in Gonzaga versus People GR number 195671, January 29, 2015. Here's another question. Roger, the leader of the crime syndicate in Malate, Manila, uh, demanded a payment by Antonio, the owner of a motel in the area of 10,000 a month, 10,000 pesos a month, as protection money, with the monthly payments, Roger assured that the syndicate would provide protection to Antonio, his business, and his employees. Uh, should Antonio refuse, Roger warned that the motel owner would either be killed or his establishment would be destroyed. Antonio refused to pay the protection money, and days later, at around 3 in the morning, Mauro, a, mem a member of the criminal syndicate, arrived at Antonio's home and hurled a grenade into an open window of the bedroom where Antonio, his wife, and Sid's three-year-old daughter were sleeping. All three of them were, were killed instantly when the grenade exploded. State with reasons the crime or crimes that had been committed as well as the aggravating circumstance, if any, attended thereto. Uh, this was asked in the bar last 2008. By the, the answer, by demanding protection money under threat and intimidation that the businessman Antonio would be killed or his establishment destroyed if he would refuse to pay, the protection money, the crime of grave threats is committed by Roger, the leader of the crime syndicate. For killing the businessman, his wife, and three-year-old daughter, the complex crime of multiple murder was committed by Mauro, a member of the same crime syndicate. The killing is qualified by the use of an explosive hand grenade. The treachery attending the killing shall be separately appreciated as another aggravating circumstance aside from the use of explosive as a qualifying circumstance. The other aggravating circumstances which may be appreciated are number one, dwelling, number two, nocturnity, number three, treachery, 
Number four, the offense and other offense. Okay, let's start by number one, the dwelling. Because the killings were committed in the home of the victims who had not given any provocation. Number two, the no nocturnity. Considering that the offenders carried out the killing at 3 a.m., indicative of a deliberate choice of night time for the commission of the crime. Number three, the treachery. Under Article 14 of Paragraph 16 of the Revised Penal Code, mentioned above, considering that the victims were all asleep when they were killed. And the last is the offense was committed by a person who belongs to an organized or syndicate crime group. Okay, here's another scenario. Uh, another question. Is abuse of superior strength present as an aggravating circumstance when it is shown that two accused attack a lone victim? The answer, no. Abuse of su superior strength is present whenever there is a notorious inequality of forces between the victim and the aggressor. Assuming a situation of superiority of strength notoriously advantageous for the aggressor selected or taken advantage or by him in the commission of the crime. The fact that there were two persons who attacked the victim does not per se establish that the crime was committed with a use of superior strength. There being no proof of relative strength of the aggressor and the victim. So the evidence must establish that the assailants purposely sought the advantage or that they had the deliberate intent to use this advantage. To take advantage of superior strength means to purposely use excessive force out of proportion to the means of defense available to the person attacked. The appreciation of this aggravating circumstance depends on the age, size, and strength of the party. This was taken from the case of Fantastico versus Maliksi, Senor, GR number 190912, January 12, 2015. Here's another question. For treachery to be appreciated, is it enough to show that the attack against the intended victim was unexpected? The answer, no. The unexpectedness of an attack cannot be the sole basis of a finding of treachery, even if the attack was intended to kill another as long as the victim's position was merely accidental. The treachery, as a qualifying circumstance, must be deliberately sought to ensure the safety of the accused from the defense acts of the victim. A finding of the existence of treachery should be based on a clear, convincing evidence. Such evidence must be a conclusive as the fact of killing itself. In this case, no evidence was presented to show that petitioner consciously adopted or reflected on the means, method, or form of attack to secure his unfair advantage. This is taken from the case of Serrera versus People, JR number 181843. July 14, 2014. Uh, other two circumstances found in the RPC affecting the criminal liability is number one, the absolute cause, and number two, the extenuating circumstances. Number one, the absolutory cause has the effect of exempting circumstance and it is predicated on lack of voluntariness such as instigation. Example, in case of instigation and in case a relative of a principal is charged as an accessory, he is exempt from criminal liability. Number two, extenuating circumstances. Extenuating circumstances has the effect of mitigating the criminal liability of the offender. Example, in case of infanticide, concealment of dishonor is an extenuating circumstance insofar as the pregnant women and the maternal grandparents are concerned. 
Abortion under Article 258 would also mitigate the liability of the pregnant woman if the purpose is to conceal dishonor, but such is not available to the parents of the pregnant woman. Also in Article 333, if the person guilty of adultery committed the offense while being abandoned without justification, the penalty next lower in degree shall be imposed. And here's another topic for the criminal law. The person's criminally liable. Okay. Here's the question. Uh, A asked B to kill C because of a grave injustice done to A by C. A promised B a reward. B was willing to kill C, not so much because of the reward promised to him, but because he also had his own long-standing grudge against C, who had wronged him in the past. If C is killed by B, would A be liable as a principal by inducement? The answer no. A would not be liable as a principal by inducement because the reward he promised is not the sole impelling reason which made B to kill C. To bring about criminal liability of a co-principal, the inducement made by the inducer must be the sole consideration which caused the person induced to commit the crime and without which the crime would not have been committed. The facts of the case indicate that B, the killer supposedly induced by A, had his own reason to kill C out of the long-standing grudge. Here's another question. Lai Lai convinced AAA to accompany here at a wake at Paranaque City. Before proceeding to the wake, Lai Lai and AA went to Bulungan Fish Port along the coastal road to ask for some fish. When they reached the fish port, they proceeded to a kabuhan. Lai Lai suddenly pulled AA inside a room where a man known by the name Speed was sitting. A.A. saw Speed give money to Lailai and heard Speed tell Lailai to look for a younger girl. Thereafter, Speed wielded a knife, tied A.A.'s hand, and raped her. Is Lailai guilty for the crime of rape as principal by inducement cooperation? The answer uh, no, Laila is not a principal by an indispensable cooperation. To be a principal by indispensable cooperation, one must participate in the criminal resolution. A conspiracy or unity in criminal purpose and cooperation in the commission of the offense by performing another act without which it would not have been accomplished. The act of Lai Lai in convincing AAA to go with her until Lai Lai received the money from Speed who raped AAA are not indispensable in the crime of rape. Anyone could have accompanied AAA and, offer, and offered the latter service in exchange for money and AAA could still have been raped. This was taken from the case of People v. Dolai, JR number 193854, September 28, 2012. Okay, the another section or the another topic is the penalties. The penalties, purpose of the state in punishing the crimes. Uh, the state has an extensive of its own to maintain a conscience, to assert and a moral principles to be vindicated, and penal justice must therefore be exercised by the state in the service and satisfaction of a duty, and rests primarily in the moral rightfulness of the punishment inflicted. The basis of the right to punish violations of penal law is the police power of the state. 
Next topic here is the indeterminate sentence law. Here's another scenario. Uh, this was taken from the question of the bar 2013. Bruno was charged with homicide for killing the 75-year-old owner of his rooming house. The prosecution proved that Bruno stabbed the owner causing his death and that the killing happened at 10 in the evening in the house where the victim and Bruno lived. Bruno, on the other hand, successfully proved that he voluntarily surrendered to the authorities, that he pleaded guilty to the crime charge, that it was the victim who first attacked and did so without any provocation on his or Bruno's part, that he prevailed because he managed to draw his knife with which he stabbed the victim. The penalty for homicide is reclusion temporal. Assuming a judgment of conviction and after considering the attendant circumstance, what penalty should the judge impose? The answer, Bruno should be sentenced to an indeterminate sentence penalty of arrest mayor in any of its period as minimum to prison correctional in its medium period as maximum. Bruno was entitled to the privilege mitigating circumstances of incomplete self-defense and the presence of at least two ordinary mitigating circumstances, which is number one, the voluntary surrender, and number two, the plea of guilt. Uh, without any aggravating circumstance under Article 69 and 64 of Paragraph 5 of the Revised Penal Code, respectively, which lowers the prescribed penalty for homicide, which is reclusion temporal to prison correctional. The further explanation is that in this kind of question, the bar examiner wants you to, com to determine whether there was self-defense or not. The problem provides that the defense was able to prove that it was the man who first attacked Bruno. Therefore, there was unlawful aggression, but there was no provocation coming from Bruno. Therefore, there was a lack of sufficient provocation, so two elements of self-defense are present. How about the third element of self-defense reasonable necessity of the means employed to present or repeal the attack is this present the third element uh, of self-defense is absent because uh, based on the facts proven by Bruno although it was the man who attacked Bruno first he prevailed upon the man because he made use of a knife and stabbed the man. While the man attacked Bruno by means of his fist, uh, it is not reasonably necessary for Bruno to make use of a knife in killing the man. So what we have is an incomplete self-defense. Under the paragraph 1 of Article 13, in case of incomplete defense, if aside from unlawful aggression, another element is present, but not all. We have a privilege mitigating circumstance. Therefore, this incomplete self-defense shall be treated as a privilege mitigating circumstance. Okay, the prosecution was able to prove that the man is 75 years old. Would you consider the aggravating circumstance of this respect of age? The answer, no. Even if Bruno killed the said 75-year-old man, there was no showing in the problem that he disrespected the age of the man. Okay, would you consider nighttime as an aggravating circumstance? The answer, no. Even if the problem says that the crime was committed at 10 in the evening. It did not say whether the house was lighted or not. So there was also no showing that the offender deliberately sought nighttime to commit the crime. 
Okay. Would you consider the dwelling? The answer is no. In the said dwelling, both Bruno and the victim are residing. Therefore, dwelling is not an aggravating circumstance because both of them are living in the same dwelling. It cannot be said that when Bruno killed the man, he dis disrespected the dwelling of the said man. Therefore, we have no aggravating circumstance present. Take note that Bruno was able to prove a voluntary surrender. Voluntary plea of guilt. And then, uh, we have an incomplete self-defense. It is a privilege mitigating circumstance. So, applying these conclusions, we have two ordinary mitigating circumstances with one privilege mitigating circumstance and with no aggravating circumstance. So, how do we compute the penalty? Number one, consider first the privilege mitigating circumstance. Okay, whenever there is a privilege mitigating circumstance present, apply it first before computing the penalty. In this example, since we have incomplete self-defense, you have to lower the penalty by one degree because it is a privilege mitigating circumstance. Thus, it will become pression mayor. Number two, consider the ordinary mitigating circumstance. So now that there are two ordinary mitigating circumstances with no aggravating circumstance, Article 64 provides that when there are two mitigating with no aggravating, lower the penalty by one degree. Therefore, if you lower it by one degree from pression mayor, it is now pression correctional. Okay, number three, determine the maximum sentence after considering all justifying, exempting, mitigating, and aggravating circumstances, if any. So, you have already applied everything. So, it will have pression correctional in its medium penalty or in its medium period. And number four, the last, determine the minimum term of the sentence. Okay, you go one degree lower and that is arresto mayor. Therefore, arresto mayor in its medium period or any period in the discretion of the court is the minimum term of the sentence. And that's how the indeterminate sentence law. Okay, here's another scenario. Maki, a security guard, arrived home late one night after rendering overtime. He was shocked to see Joy, his wife, and Ken, his best friend, in the act of having sexual intercourse. Maki pulled out his service gun and shot and killed Ken. The court found that Ken died under exceptional circumstances and exonerated Maki of murder, but sentence him to the shero, conformably with Article 247 of the Revised Penal Code. The court also ordered Maki to pay indemnity to the ears of the victim in the amount of 50000 While serving a sentence, Maki entered the prohibited area and had a pot session with Ivy, which is Joy's sister. Is Maki entitled to an indeterminate sentence in case he is found guilty of the use of prohibited substances? Explain your answers. Uh, this was taken from the bar 2007 questions. The answer? No, Maki is not entitled to the benefit of the indeterminate sentence law, which is RA1403 as amended for having evaded the sentence which banish or place him in this shero. In section 2 of the said law expressly provides that the law shall not apply to those who have evaded sentence. The alternative answer here is that no, because the penalty for use of any dangerous drug by a first offender is not imprisonment but 
rehabilitation in a government center for a minimum period of six months, which is under Section 15 of RA 9165. Now, the indeterminate sentence law does not apply when the penalty is imprisonment not exceeding one year. Okay, here's another scenario. This was taken from the bar 2010 question. An agonizing and protracted trial having come to a close, the judge found A guilty beyond reasonable doubt of homicide and imposed on him a straight penalty of six years and one day of prison mayor. The public, the public prosecutor objected to the sentence on the ground that the proper penalty should have been 12 years and one day of reclusion temporal. The, de the defense counsel chimed in and then contending that application of the indeterminate sentence law should lead to the imposition of a straight penalty of six months and one day of prison correctional only. Who of the three is on the right track? Okay, the answer. None of the contentions is correct because... The indeterminate sentence law, or RA 4103 as amended, had not been followed. Because the imposition of penalty for the crime of homicide, which penalized by imprisonment exceeding one year and is divisible, is covered by the indeterminate sentence law. The said law... It requires that the sentence in this case should reflect a minimum term for purposes of parole and maximum term fix the limit of the imprisonment. Imposing a straight penalty is incorrect. Okay, here's another question. What is subsidiary penalty? The subsidiary penalty is a personal liability which is to be suffered by a convict who has no property with which to meet the fine or at the rate of one day for each amount equivalent to the highest minimum wage rate prevailing in the Philippines at the time of the rendition of judgment of conviction by the trial court which is in Article 39 as amended by RA 10159, approved on April 10, 2012. Okay, the question here is, when may it be imposed? The answer, uh, number one, when there is a principal penalty of imprisonment or any other principal penalty and it carries with it a fine. Number two, when the penalty is only fine. Another question. Is subsidiary penalty an accessory penalty? The answer. A subsidiary penalty is not an accessory penalty. It is a penalty imposed upon the accused and served by him in lieu of the fine, which he fails to pay on account of insolvency. So the accused cannot be made to undergo subsidiary imprisonment unless the judgment expressly so provides. Okay, here's another question. What are the three systems of imposition of penalties in case two or more penalties are imposed on one and the same accused? Number one, material accumulation system. Number two, Juridical accumulation system. Number three, absorption system. Let's go to number one, material accumulation system. The material accumulation system, no limitation whatever. All the penalties for all violations were imposed even if they reach beyond the natural span of life. Number two, juridical accumulation system. The juridical accumulation system limited to not more than the threefold length of time corresponding to the most severe and in no case exceed 40 years. 
Number three, absorption system. The absorption system, the lesser penalties are absorbed by the graver penalties. It is observed in the imposition of the penalty in complex crime, continuing crimes, and special complex crimes like robbery with homicide and etc. Okay, here's the next topic, uh, which is the plurality of crimes. Okay, what is the effect of a compound crime in the criminal liability of the offender? Okay, the answer. The, pen, uh, the effect of compound crime in the criminal liability of the offender is that the penalty for the most serious crime in its maximum period shall be imposed. Uh, here's another question here. Um, while Antonio was outside the kitchen of their house and Martin in the yard, Alejandro was spotted near the vicinity of their house. Suddenly, Alejandro threw a grenade towards the cemented part of the yard. The grenade exploded and Antonio was hurt in his pelvic area, which Martin, his father, was fatally hit by a shrapnel causing his death. What is the criminal liability of Alejandro? The answer Alejandro is liable for murder with frustrated murder. The act of Alejandro in throwing a grenade to Martin and Antonio is a single act, which resulted to the death of Martin and the injuries of Antonio. The single act constitutes two or more grave or less grave felonies, which are murder and frustrated murder. Hence, the crime should be complex and the penalty of the most serious crime in its maximum period should, should be imposed. Uh, this is found in the case of People v. Dulai, uh, GR number 194629, April 21, 2014. Another question here. X barge inside a conference room. And with the use of a high-powered firearm, pressed the gun, and several bullets came out in assault and four people died. What crime or crimes is or are committed by X? The answer, X is liable for four counts of murder. In the case of People versus Tobacco, the four murders which resulted from a burst of gunfire cannot be considered a complex crime. They are separate crimes. The accused appellant must therefore be held liable for each and every death he has caused and sentenced accordingly to four sentences of reclusion perpetua. It was duly proved Beyond doubt that the gun used by the accused is admittedly an automatic, powerful weapon. More powerful than the M16 Armalite rifle. So it is so powerful that the bullets can penetrate even more than five persons resulting to their deaths. And this was proven when, according to witness uh, Rosario Penaira, the bullets even destroyed the cemented rail guard, separating the lower and upper bleachers of the cockpit arena and causing wounds on his face and on his right shoulder. So this was taken from People vs. Tobacco, GR number 100382-100382. 1-0-0-3-8-5, March 19, 1997. Okay. Another question here. Uh, Mayor Tawan Tawan, together with his security escorts, went home to Salvador, Lanao del Norte, on board a yellow pickup service vehicle at around 3 p.m. of the same day. 
Nelmeda, together with his other co-accused, surreptitiously waited for the vehicle of the group of Mayor Tawan-Tawan. The moment to pick up service vehicle passed by the aforesaid waiting shed, Nelmeda and their co-accused opened fire and rained bullets on the vehicle using high-powered firearms killing two security escorts while injuring others. Nelmeda and his co-accused were charged with double murder with multiple frustrated murder and double attempted murder. Are Nelmeda and his other co-accused guilty of the said complex crime? The answer, no. The killing and the wounding of the victims were not the result of a single discharge of firearms by Nelmeda and his co-accused. To note, Nelmeda and his co-accused opened fire and rained bullets on the vehicle boarded by Mayor Tawantawan and his group. As a result, two security escorts died while five of them were wounded and injured. The victims sustained gunshot wounds in different parts of their bodies. Therefrom, it cannot be gainsaid that more than one bullet had hit the victims. Moreover, more than one gunman fired at the, gu- at the vehicles of the victims. As held in People v. Valdez, 304-611-1999, each act by each gunman pulling the trigger of their respective firearms aiming each particular moment at different persons con- constitutes distinct and individual acts which cannot give rise to a complex crime. Uh, this is People versus Nelmida GR number 184500 September 11, 2012. Okay, another scenario here. A group of Navy personnel went to a canteen to have some drinks at around 10 in the evening. They transferred to a videoki bar named um, Aquarius uh, where they continued their drinking session. Shortly thereafter, a heated argument ensued between Bacosa and Ponsalan. To avoid further trouble, the other Navy personnel tried to pacify the two and decided to leave the, the premises of the Aquarius and return to their camp. Soon after the Navy personnel passed the sentry gate, a maroon Nissan Vaughn was rushing and zigzagging the road towards the group of Navy personnel. Ponsalan was recognized as the driver and the van speed towards uh, the van speed away towards the camp and suddenly swerved to the right hitting the group of the walking navy personnel two of the navy personnel were dead while the others sustained serious injuries in their body what is the crime uh, what is the criminal liability of Punzalan? Ponsalan is guilty of the complex crime of murder with attempted murder. When a single act constitutes two or more grave or less grave felonies, the penalty for the most serious crime shall be imposed, the same to be applied in its maximum period. Ponsalan was animated by a single purpose, to kill the Navy personnel and committed a single act of st- Stepping on the accelerator, swerving to the right side of the road and ramming through the Navy personnel. The crimes of murder and attempted murder are both grave felonies and the law attaches an inflictive penalty to capital punishment, which is reclusion perpetua to death. For murder, while attempted murder is punished by pression mayor and afflicted penalty. This case is based on People v. Ponsalan, GR number 199892, uh, December 10, 2012. Here's another topic. Uh, special, special complex crimes vis-a-vis complex crime. In a special complex crime, um, 
Special complex crime is it is the law which specify for the crimes that should be combined. While in the complex crime, the law merely states two or more grave or less grave felonies or an offense is necessary to commit the other. Another category here. In special complex crime, the law provides for a single penalty. While in the complex crime, the penalty to be imposed will be the most serious crime in its maximum period. In special complex crime, the light felony committed in the commission of the crime is absorbed. While in the complex crime, the light felony committed would constitute a separate and distinct charge. Okay. Another topic here is the probation law. Uh, the probation law as amended by RA number 10707. Here's a scenario. Arnel Colinares was found guilty of frustrated homicide by the RTC. On, on appeal, CA affirmed. On petition for review, uh, Supreme Court ruled that he was only guilty of attempted homicide in which the penalty is probationable. Is Colinaris now entitled to apply for probation upon remand of the case to the lower court even after he has perfected his appeal to a previous conviction, which is frustrated homicide, which was not probational? The answer here is yes, the probation law as amended provides that no application for probation shall be entertained or granted if the defendant has perfected the appeal from the judgment of conviction. So, provided that when a judgment of conviction imposing a non-probational uh, penalty is appealed or reviewed and such judgment is modified, through the imposition of the probationable penalty, the defendant shall be allowed to apply for probation based on the modified decision before such decision becomes final. The application for probation based on a modified decision shall be filed in the trial court where the judgment of conviction imposing a non-probational penalty was rendered or in the trial court where such case has since been re-raffled so in in a case involving several defendants where some have taken farther appeal the other defendants may apply for probation by submitting a written application and attaching thereto a certified true copy of the judgment of conviction now the trial court shall Upon receipt of the application filed, suspend the execution of the sentence imposed in the judgment. This is notwithstanding, the accused shall lose the benefit of probation should he seek a review of a modified decision which actually imposes a probational uh, penalty. Now, probation may be granted, or whether the sentence imposes a term of imprison imprisonment or a fine only. The filing of the application shall be deemed a waiver of the right to appeal. An order granting or denying a probation shall not be appealable, which is found in RA 10707, Section 1, Amending Section 4 of PD Number 968, approved last November 26, 2015. Uh, here's the alternative answer. What is clear is that had the RTC done what was right and imposed on Arnell the correct penalty of two years and four months maximum he would have had the right to apply for probation arnold did not appeal from the judgment that would have allowed him to apply for probation 
he did not have a choice between appeal and probation. So while it is true that probation is a mere privilege, the point is not that Arnell has the right to such privilege, but he certainly does not have. What he has is the right to apply for the for that kind of for that kind of privilege. If the court allows him to apply for probation because of the lowered penalty, it is still up to the trial judge to decide whether or not to grant him the privilege of probation. So, taking into account the full circumstances of this case, uh, this was this case is. Uh, Colinares versus People GR number 182748 December 13, 2011 Here's another scenario Mino was convicted by final judgment of the crime of arbitrary detention and was sentenced to suffer imprisonment by the RTC On that ground, Benna filed a petition to disqualify Mino from running for Punong Barang Barangay. Meno argued that he was already granted probation, which effectively restores him all the civil rights, including the right to vote and be voted for in the elections. The Comelec and Monk disqualified Meno citing Section 40A of the Local Government Code. Meno, Meno argues that the disqualification under the local government code applies only to those who have served their sentence and not to probationers because the latter do not serve the adjudged sentence. The probation law should allegedly be read as an exemption to the local government code. Is Meno disqualified from running for public office? The answer here is no. Meno is not disqualified from running for public office. During the period of probation, the probationer is not disqualified from running for a public office because the accessory penalty of suspens suspension from public office is put on hold for the duration of the probation. The period within which a person is under probation cannot be equated with service of the sentence a judge. Section 4 of the probation law specifically provides that the grant of probation suspends the execution of the sentence. So, during the period of probation, the probationer does not serve the penalty imposed upon him by the court, but merely reacquired to comply with all the conditions prescribed in the probation order. So the probation law should be construed as an exception to the local government code. This is Moreno versus Comelec, GR number uh, 168550, August 10, 2006. Uh, here's another topic. Uh, pardon... Vis-a-vis uh, -vis probation. Okay, pardon. Pardon is extinguishes criminal liability. Well, the probation, uh, it does not extinguish criminal liability, but merely suspends the execution of the sentence. In pardon, the pardon includes any crime and is exercised individually by the president. While the probation, the probation exercised individually by the trial court. Now, pardon, pardon merely looks forward and relieves the offender from the consequence of all offenses of which he has been convicted. While in probation, it promotes the correction and rehabilitation of an offender by providing him with individualized treatment provides an opportunity for the reformation of a penitent offender which might be less prob probable if he were to serve a present sentence and prevent the commission of offenses. Uh, while, the, while the pardon 
Uh, the pardon does not work for the restoration of the rights to hold public office or the right of suffrage unless such rights are expressly restored by means of pardon. While the probation, the probation, those who have not served their sentence by reason of the grant of the probation, uh, I mean of the probation, which should not be equated with service of sentence, should not likewise be disqualified from running for a local elective office because the two-year period of ineligibility under Section 40A of the Local Government Code does not even begin to run. While in pardon, uh, the pardon exercise uh, when the person is already convicted. While in probation, the probation uh, must be exercised within the period for perfecting an appeal. Uh, in pardon, uh, being a private act by the president, it must be pleaded and proved by the person pardoned. In, while in probation, uh, being a grant by the trial court, it follows that the trial court also has the power to order its revocation in a proper case and under proper circumstances. In pardon again, the pardon does not alter the fact that the accused is an recidivist as it produces only the extinction of the personal effects of the penalty. While in probation, the probation does not alter the fact that the accused is a recidivist as it provides only for for an opportunity of reformation to the penitent offender while the pardon does not extinguish the civil liability of the offender on the other hand the probation the probation does not extinguish the civil liability of the offender Okay, that's it for now. That's the end of the UST, uh, University of Santa Tomas Criminal Law, Pre-Week Notes 2016, Part 2. And I'll be back for the Part 3. Thank you so much for listening. I do hope I contributed something to help your criminal law review for the Philippine Bar Exam. I am doing this reading or audio to help also myself as I am struggling with my focus in reviewing the bar exam. I really find it hard to study, especially reading these notes. So I decided to make this video so that even if I am doing something or I am in public places, I still be reviewing the bar in my earphones if you want also a copy of my reading audio please send me a message or if you want me to read some other bar reviewers in my email ad sender5681 at gmail.com or to my facebook page sender5681 it would be a pleasure to help others while I am reviewing for the bar exam and I am so happy to share these things to my fellow bar candidates. Thank you so much and God bless.